person who needs no introduction at all in this crowd, Dick Van Grinsman. Dick, do you want to come on out and take a seat? opportunity to do this. This is really nice that we can do this for Dick. And, um, and, uh, and for bringing uh, all the supporters together, the supporters of the RV1 project. Um, mostly what I want to do is say thanks. I want to say thanks to all the volunteers who in any way gave us all the privilege of participating in the community effort to bring the RV1 back to the forefront of the external aviation community. You know, some folks gave money. Some gave equipment, some gave tools, some people gave us space. Um, a lot of people and companies gave us parts. I didn't even think of them as companies. We'd call up and we'd talk to whoever it was that ran it. Uh, and, and many, many people gave their time. Um, we did not want this to be a Texas project. That's where the airplane was when we restored it. Uh, a lot of folks that were in Texas were able to work on it, but we had people come from all across the country and spent time working on it, getting their hands dirty and working on it. And then we were able to share it with the whole country. So everybody that made it happen, thank you very, very much. It was very important. Um, when I was first introduced to the RV-1 in the dusty, dark corner of a hangar uh, down in, um, on the east side of Houston at a little private strip, it was about four years ago, two years ago, my first thought was, wouldn't it be cool to get a hold of this and give it back to Van? Well, I'll be honest. My first thought was, I want to fly that airplane. <laughs> when I see an airplane, right, Dick, you're probably the same way. If you see an airplane, you want to fly it. You've got to do that. But, but I said, you know, it would be really neat. The ultimate idea was, could we, if we could get this thing, get acquired, and restore it to where it was safe to fly, and actually fly it to Oshkosh, that would be an incredible thing. Well, we did so much more than that because it's going to be perpetually preserved in the museum here. And before that, we flew it about 12,000 miles. And when I say we, I mean people out there. We did something that, as far as I can tell, is kind of unprecedented. We took this thing, we passed it from pilot to pilot. We gave it from person to person, people we could trust, but some people who I had never met. And we sent it around the country, about 12,000 miles, 120 hours of flying. Um, but that's about the airplane. I'm going to say a few things about the airplane more at the banquet tonight, if you're there. Um, you know, we ended up with what, what I really want to talk about is the community effort. And what we wanted to do was give this gift to Dick, to Van. Because it's a gift of saying, we appreciate everything you've done with all the airplanes you've built along the way. It's not a gift of an airplane because we didn't give it to you. We gave it to the museum. And you gave it to the museum. This was a gift of, of not an airplane, but of the time and the commitment. And it was a way to bring your efforts back to the forefront of experimental aviation. Not just your efforts as a designer but as a pioneer of getting people involved, of getting people involved in flying affordably, getting people involved in flying safely, which is really important, as well as building the next generation of people, not just to be pilots, but to be good citizens. And we're going to see some of that as well. Uh, Friends of the RV-1 was formed, uh, and, and I hope people don't, don't understand, or understand it. Friends of the RV-1 is, is just a couple people. And, and I can't say enough about uh, Ernie Butcher, who helped to set this up, and my wife Louise, who has been just invaluable for this whole thing. Uh, and, and it's not a membership organization, it's just a, a nonprofit, and a lot of people gave time, money, and effort to make this happen. You know, the RV-1, when we found it, was not flying. Dick had, had it for a number of years, he sold it to a guy, a fellow in Texas. He sold it to someone else in Texas. It really hung out in Texas for quite a while. And when we decided to restore it, we had to tell people what restoration really meant. Restoration, in this sense, was to make it airworthy. Um, and, uh, and, and we were able to do that. The, um, there have been a lot of modifications over the years, particularly firewall forward. We had to undo a lot of those to make it, to make it safe. But we really wanted to take it on tour 
to raise awareness, to show the community what they had done, and, and quite frankly, because, uh, because it was neat. So we were able to share this, this airplane with people all over. The only, the only place it didn't get was the southwest U.S. because we just ran out of time. But the east, coast can, uh, the east coast of the U.S., the southeast, Canada, all the way across the barnstorming tour to the west coast and then up into, into the northwest and finally back across here. I think Joe Blank ended up with the most hours of anybody flying in about 24 hours, other than Van, of course. Uh, in the modern era, uh, Joe ended up with our, uh, our most, most hours. Uh, yesterday, we accomplished, accomplished our goals with the airplane. It made it to Oshkosh under its own power, on its own wings. I had told all of my pilots that the most important thing was to get it here intact. If it missed dates, it missed dates due to weather. And if, if worst came to worst, we'd take the wings off, put it on a truck, and bring it here. But we got it here under, under its own power and under its own wings. And uh, it made it to uh, a little place about 30 miles south of here, Dodge County, on, uh, I think it was Saturday. And I refused to say that the mission was done until it made it here yesterday, because, you know, you never know. Today, we, the community of builders, the community of owners, the builders of flyers, all the workers, the vendors, the contributors, the friends of the RV1, the families of the experimental community. Today we're really wrapping up the RV1 efforts and we want to prepare the community to think about what comes next and who comes next. And Van's commitment to those young folks who will take the reins in the years to come. And you're going to talk, hear from them uh, very shortly. But today, just now, I want, to, uh, I want to give you something, Dick, to thank you from the community and if Louise and Joe would come up here, um, this, this, uh, this little gift was something that I think was made about four days ago, and, and we, um, we managed to kind of keep it hidden from you, and I don't know how we did that, but we kind of had people knowing, knowing where you were, because every signature on this banner has been done here at Oshkosh so far, and it's going to go back over to the tent so people can sign it if you haven't. The signatures on here represent thousands who helped but couldn't come. We want everybody to keep signing it uh, at Dan's tent. And these signatures are just the tip of the iceberg, and it's a token of appreciation for the community of aviation. So, Dick, thank you very much. Well, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll find a prominent place to hang that and uh, display it at the factory, at the headquarters. And uh, sure want to uh, thank you for, and, and your other volunteers for all the efforts you put in to restore the airplane and make the tour a success. I know when you first located the airplane, you offered me the opportunity or us the factory. And we sort of figured that really your enthusiasm and your, your talents could best achieve this end rather than we taking it and trying to find time to do that. So, um, as you say, it's a community effort. It was a great effort. And I think was probably uh, attracted more attention than I would have expected. And thanks to you for that. And Louise, uh, Ernie, and everyone else. So thank you. Thank you. I guess the RV-1 had been in Oshkosh one year or more. Um, I never had it at Oshkosh. I had it at Rockford, where the convention was held up until 1970, I believe. Um, but one of the subsequent owners had had it here at least one year or more. So it's back. <laughs> OK, so let's just talk a little bit about the RV-1 and the uh, 40 years and counting it. Kid aircraft. Bringing that airplane into Oshkosh. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Bringing it in yesterday? Yes. That was quite an experience. Um, it had all been pretty well orchestrated uh, to a greater extent than I realized with the other airplanes that were coming in in the, in the formation, in the arrival formation. A lot of work had gone into that by uh, the various formation groups. Falcon Squadron, 
I'm not even sure I have the name right. Stu McCurdy and all of his people, Falcon Flight. Um, I was very impressed with the level of organization that these pilots have put into it. I know that for many years, uh, Stu and others have been doing very good work in um, training and uh, doing very uh, highly disciplined, highly skilled uh, formation flying. But uh, it just reminded me, though, with, with um, as I witnessed their briefing, that the uh, level of skill that they've achieved and the dedication and, and the discipline. And I guess the lesson there is that regardless of the type of flying we're doing, the more professionally and the more disciplined we do it, the, the more enjoyable and the safer it's going to be. But that said, uh, one of the other concerns was just flying this airplane in, at least for me, a, a loose formation. Uh, in very hot weather, uh, low altitude, coming in here that I and everyone else consider the physiological factors and make sure that um, you know, I'm willing to put up with some discomfort on a flight like that, but you don't want to push your limits too far. As it turned out, uh, I was more comfortable and more at ease on the flight than <clears throat> I thought I might have been under the temperatures that we experienced. But um, when we uh, first got in the air, most of the rest of the flight had taken off in advance. I think I was about the last one to take off. And seeing this mass of airplanes all formed up in dispel the numbers 40 and various other uh, groupings, uh, it was it was very moving. It was very uh, inspirational, I guess, because uh, I could appreciate the amount of effort that went into it. And I was just sort of bringing up the rear. <laughs> well, it looked, it looked fantastic. We had a great afternoon yesterday. Um, I want to bring up uh, a couple of the people to talk with you a little bit about another area that's close to your heart, and that is youth, um, or your youth builders. Uh, our next generation of builders. Um, is John Cox here, uh, Bob Kelly, you guys want to come up and say a few words and talk with Van about your project? This is Team Flight and Eagle's Nest. And, and yes, uh, yeah, that's fine. Bring, them, bring the kids up. And Ted Millar, right? You're here? Well, there are, I think everybody for many years has, has acknowledged that it is necessary to uh, get younger people involved in aviation. And for many of us with uh, gray and white hair or no hair, but, and that's better than the next alternative. But there are a lot of different ways to get youth involved. Obviously, I build airplanes and try to design them. So naturally, that's the way we envision getting youth involved. As I say, there are many other ways. But we, we really think that uh, uh, this is a, a means of getting a very meaningful, in-depth involvement in aviation at a young age. This is the biggest uh, thrill of uh, Oshkosh, and there's certainly a lot of them. Uh, I'm really uh, following up on Team Flight, Three Eagles Nest. Uh, we started a project at Jennings County High School, uh, actually right about two years ago. I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you just brief what happened. I tried to find a school for a long time, it took a while. I talked to the school about a year before and I got a phone call and they said, we're ready to start. I said, great, when do you want to start? He said, how about Tuesday? <laughs> uh, that was how Eagle's Nest One began. And uh, without the great kit that came out of that factory, this could have never happened. And you see a lot of different color t-shirts back here. The blue ones are my guys. I love every one of them. <clears throat> 
I've seen them grow, and I am just thrilled to have been a small part of getting, and we do have our, I think we have the youngest airplane here. It was signed off last Monday afternoon. <laughs> These guys work almost day and night for that last. And, when, and Indiana had the longest stretch of 100 degree plus weather they've ever had. Our group is uh, from the Portland, Oregon area. Uh, several years ago, uh, a group of us that were passionate about aviation were talking with Dick. We've all been supporting a program that started 20 years ago where they had kids building model airplanes and then uh, getting simulator training, things like that. And Dick <clears throat> said, you know, this is such a good program. We need to keep this going after the, the gentleman passed away that started that program. And so a lot of us talked and decided to start a team build program using the RV-12 because it was a perfect airplane for that use. Uh, very well designed. Uh, it was a very <clears throat> detailed kit. In fact, Dick said it was the best kit that they had ever produced. And he said it was so simple, Ted, you could even build one. <laughs> but we uh, got a group of people together that were passionate about aviation. <clears throat> we got the kit going. and. The, this group behind us, uh, three of them are from the uh, first group we call Team Flight One. We had uh, 12 kids in that program, built an airplane, got it certified, and they're all getting their training at it. In fact, uh, one of the young men back here, Eric, where, where are you, Eric? Uh, he started with his program building model airplanes when he was 11 or 12. He helped build the first airplane. He's a student mentor in the second airplane. He just got his pilot's license uh, about a week and a half ago. And he... <laughs> and Eric uh, got to fly that part, uh, Team Flight 1 to Oshkosh. And I said, wow, what was that like, Eric? That's 14 hours. He said, well, he got to walk a lot of time. <laughs> The second group uh, we started, we have 15 young people involved, and uh, they go from, uh, in that program, from 12 years old to uh, the student mentors at Eric's now 19, and we have two young women uh, involved in our program, and they're doing a great job, too. That's uh, Paige. Where's Amy? Paige and Amy. Oh, right here. <laughs> I look back at all those yellow shirts. But you know, the thing that's most impressive to all of us is it's the kids and how dedicated they are. And you know, the thing I've been impressed with uh, Dick Van Brunsman and his family, I've gotten to know Dick over the years, and um, <clears throat> he's changed aviation as we all know it um, with the RV airplanes uh, because he's a very dedicated person that wants things safe and he won't let you change it just for speed. But you know, the thing that's really more impressive to me than that is Dick and his family uh, are mentors. They come out there every Saturday and work with those kids. So he not only has done it, but he does it every day. And Dick, I'm really impressed with that. Thank you for helping me. Dick. I want to say one more thing. As of this morning, Team Flight and Eagles Nest have joined forces. And I think we're going to do a lot more as one than going our own way. So. Ernie, would you like to come out here? No, I just want uh, it's time. It's time, okay. No. Yes, introduce yourself. I'm Justin Inman, Team Flight 2 Builder. Mr. Grant Grinson, on behalf of Team Flight Program and the Eagles Nest Program, we present this signed poster to you 
for your wonderful mentorship, your inspiration, guidance, and support. It is very appreciated. Thank you very much. Justin is um, one of our star students in this program. And in addition to that, he has been writing the blog spot for the project all year. And if any of you have followed that, he's done an extremely good job of it. We're very proud of Justin and all of the other students in the program. Thanks a lot. Bernie, why don't you come out and just say a couple of words, because you're, you're a big part of this. Come on, Bernie. Come on. Bernie is very shy, a man of few words. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I have very few words right now because the kids have said it all. Are we not proud of them? Let's yeah. give them. Let's, come on, let's give them. this morning that is unprecedented and I wanted to do it because it truly is a special celebration and a special occasion. Normally we present one of our highest awards in the day, the President's Award, at a different time. But in front of the people that make Vans business and make Vans passion such a part of all of our lives, I wanted to do it this morning. So what I wanted to celebrate and recognize today, 40 years of successful business, 40 years of fabulous design work, over 7,000 kits produced. You have impacted the aviation world in a way that few ever will. As the Ayers, we're also very proud of what you've done. We're very pleased and we're inspired by what you accomplish and what you teach us to do. It is my great privilege to recognize you with this year's President's Award from EAA to say thank you for 40 years of greatness and innovation and passion. Thank you and congratulations.
project to build and to put that much time and money into it so that those 7,765 airplanes are now have flown and thousands more hopefully will. So I, I uh, again, I hate to sound like the, the Hollywood personalities, but we need to share this with a very, very wide community. Thank you, Ron. contribute in some way, so aside from building an airplane, I do a little bit of aviation art. So I uh, contacted Paul, Louise, and Ernie and asked if they would have any uh, use for an artist's rendition of the RV-1, maybe hanging at the back of the hangar for motivation or whatever they wanted to do, but they had some better ideas. They made some prints and cards and posters and stuff, and they also had the idea that we should present the original here to Dick today. So that's what we're going to do. And I just want to say, I wanted this painting to kind of embody the spirit of everybody that took part, the pilots, the volunteers, the people that worked on it, and everybody out there who wanted to be a part of it but couldn't for one reason or another. And I wanted this to be a memento for this group of people. So I wrote something on the back, and uh, it says, the title is Humble Beginnings, the RV One or the Family Farm. And the farm, I think, is a, an integral part of this whole story. So we wanted to include that. And thanks to Louise here, because she was the uh, person on the ground who uh, got the reference material for that, because there just isn't a whole lot of that around. Um, anyway, I went on and wrote on the back, presented to Richard Van Brunsman from the Friends of the RV-1, with appreciation for making these air fantastic aircraft available to the world. So uh, they, this is really from the whole group. And uh, we hope you enjoy it. And if you want to hang in the back of your hand, you go ahead. We'll again find a we'll find a very special spot for that. Uh, as many of you know, there are copies of this available over in our booth. Hopefully, those of you that appreciate it will put in a small donation to the friends of the RV One, make all this possible. But uh, it's, it's really, a, I'm kind of moved by uh, this representation because the depiction of the farm and all is quite accurate, quite accurate. And uh, I believe Joe Blank or someone at the factory um, spirited an uh, old slide I had and uh, <laughs> Without my knowledge, and very much uh, appreciated because it is quite authentic. And uh, the farm background is important in, in a lot of ways. Not that it's the only um, the, the only way to to be um, reared or raised, but um, I learned a lot there. We certainly learned the, the value of hard work. Uh, my parents were extremely honest people. And these are qualities that are, are very important that uh, are kind of the, the backbone of, of what made this business. And again, it's not the only background from which you can um, achieve these, these values and qualities, but uh, it certainly worked for me. Well, we're all gathered here. I think we have time. Um, I've still got boys left. If um, I like it, if there are any uh, questions anyone has or any areas they would uh, like to hear some worthless opinions on, I'm here. Um, yes, it. I'm going to go home and fly my sailplane. <laughs> I think it's a, a great area, a great uh, area in private flying to, to uh, 
to really enjoy yourself and to advance your piloting skills. As far as developing something, um, I have written before that as an after hours project I've been working on a medium performance single seat motor glider, which I'm still working on, but not as industriously as I should. Basically, we, we just need um, more uh, requests, more input from interested people and we'll see if something like that might materialize in the future. Developing an airplane has become more and more uh, a larger and larger project for the factory. So we've, it's got to be a business decision as well as um, just a personal interest decision to do that. And that's what I was curious about. Are you looking forward to more sailing? Am I looking forward to more soaring? Definitely. I mean, it's... It, it's one of my hobbies, and as my wife could tell you, uh, kind of a passion, uh, almost to an excessive degree at times. But uh, hey, you only go around once. Let's see another hand up. Yes. Actually, with all of the aircraft out there, uh, years ago there weren't as many selections for, for good home-built aircraft as there are now. So you, you would have found, and if you go back in the old issues of uh, sport aviation and before that when it was called the Experimenter, you would see a lot more original designs being built and showing up at the annual convention. As time went on, more of these original designs became plans built airplanes or later kit built airplanes so that now uh, the industry has really matured to the point that there are, are kits for very good and well developed airplanes so there's less motivation now uh, less reason for people to strike out on their own back then building from uh, say your own ideas and your own plans was not that much different than building from somebody else's plans because you didn't have the great kits to start with. So uh, I, I just at that time evaluating what was available, uh, I felt that I could do better and did so initially of course by modifying the, the Stitz Playboy design and evolved it into the RV-1 and then realizing that I was at about the end of the road, considering that it was sort of a hybrid, having uh, again been modified from a, a, a more basic airplane, that I needed to start over. And uh, the RV-1 was really a quite good airplane. Thus, it was the, the, the basis for the RV-3 uh, overall configuration-wise, there's very little dimensional difference between the two. Just a lot of detail. Yes, sir, in the middle. Possibility to revisit the RV-3 as a mantle kit? Possibility of uh, upgrading the RV-3 kit to a more you know, modern matchable configuration? Probably unlikely. Just, just due to the limited uh, interest in a single-seat airplane, and, the, and the, the cost and time that it would take to upgrade that kit into something equivalent to our RV-7 or 10 or 12. I think uh, we're just about out of time unless there's one more question. It's right at coming up on 11 o'clock, so. No other questions? We got one more question. Yes. Hello. Hi, um, I'm not, I've got a question. I'm from uh, the UK and I'm in a position to represent uh, the amateur builders and experimental builders in Europe because I'm, I lead an association there, a federation. And it just strikes me that this, there's a lot of talk here and it's, it doesn't quite recognize the Europe claims in Europe. There must be a thousand of them in Europe and the rest of the world. And I think someone just needs to recognize and say thank you for that and what you've done there. It's not just American, it's the whole of the world. Well, thank you. I 
Yeah, and we definitely recognize that. And uh, as time has gone on, a uh, larger and larger percentage of our business, our sales, have been uh, to international customers. So uh, it, it is it's definitely an uh, international, worldwide experience. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. We, we, we do have a theater for another hour, if you um, guys want to hang around and have some informal time. I want to thank our guests for coming up here and sharing this time with Dick today. Um, really appreciate it. They've got a, a great future ahead of them, 40 years past. Um, so from everybody here, thank you, Dick.